everybody. My name is Clint Neptune. Uh, I'm part of the staff team here. Really glad you all came out today. And you picked a good Sunday to come because we are kicking off a new series we are calling This Is Us, God's Love Story with His Church. So I don't know, in a room this size, there are probably uh, a substantial amount of people who have grown up in the church. Maybe you've gone to church your entire life. And I'm guessing there might be some who, this is the very first time they've been in a church or maybe just the first few times. I think wherever you are on that spectrum of uh, church involvement, attendance, and anywhere in between, at some point you can reasonably ask yourself this kind of question. Um, what are we doing here? Why, why are we doing this? Why did people greet me on the way in? Why do we sing songs? Why is someone giving a little message right now? Why do we do things the way that we do things? Right, I think that's reasonable to ask and a good starting place to begin to answer that is to look into the past, to look into our history. What did our spiritual forefathers do beforehand that we've inherited? Because after all, the church, the capital C church, if you will, didn't just drop out of the sky. It didn't just start two years ago or something. It's been going on a long time, 2,000 years. All of our assumptions, our customs, the way we do things, even our beliefs and our values are largely the product of people that came before us. It's a really long story. Started with the Jews and Israel and then Jesus and the church going forth across the globe it's outlasted many empires and touched diverse people groups. We are at the end chain of that really long story. Now, you might be thinking, oh no, Clint, are, are you saying we're about to do a church history series? Oh, that sounds so boring. Why are you doing that? Why didn't you pass out pillows and blankets on the way in? Because I'm gonna totally snooze out here. Why is this important for my life today? I'll tell you why. It's important because there is, I can't think of very many things that are more important than understanding where you came from, understanding your story and what brought us to this place. Kind of what shifted my perspective on this is, um, I don't know where I heard this, but it really was formative for me. You've probably heard someone re reference the early church, Jesus and the disciples are going out, maybe the first few decades or centuries of the church. And you'd be right, but Jesus said, like, I'm coming again soon. And those very first people in the early church were like, okay, that's gonna happen like, right now. It hasn't yet. It's been 2,000 years. I think soon might mean something different for us than it does on the heavenly timeline. And so no one knows when Jesus is coming back, but maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe it's in 50 years. Maybe it's in 50,000 years. I don't know. It could, it could easily be that long. And so those people would certainly look at us as on the ground floor of this movement. Like, what if we are in the early church right now? What if we are responsible for leaving this massive legacy to generations, thousands of generations to come? That could very well be the case. And so I ask you, what kind of church do we want to pass on to our children and grandchildren? and to those generations. How we live now, how we do this thing we're calling church, will affect those people. Just like our spiritual ancestors, what they did impacts us, and we're gonna look at that. Uh, so we will have the opportunity to impact all sorts of people in the years to come. And so there's a lot of little details we could look at, but there's really these, uh, there's probably more than five, but we're gonna do it for five weeks. These five big monumental seismic titanic shifts that happened in that long story that I think we carry into the day and impacts how we do things. So would you pray with me as we invite the Holy Spirit just to help us with that project? <clears throat> Holy Spirit, you are meeting us here again. We're so thankful that you are this uh, continuous presence in our lives and you are um, just in our midst in this church. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you would have us to see and to hear from you. What lessons can we learn from the past? How can we move forth and build uh, a worthwhile legacy of the church through you for our children and grandchildren. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
well, where to start in all of church history? There's a lot of places you could start. We'll start here. Let's define some things. Uh, what is the church? What is the capital C church, if you will? Because that's different from the lowercase c church. You're in one right now. Here is a lowercase c church. Here's one little expression of the body of Christ, this little gathering of believers. The capital C church is the sum total of all of those people, all followers of Jesus. Maybe across time, but at least present today, the capital C church is all followers of Jesus. Okay, fair enough. Follow-up question, what is a follower of Jesus? What is that? If I were to look around and try to find the church, the capital C church, and find the Jesus followers, what would I be looking for? What comes to mind when you think? of someone following Jesus. So just noodle on that for a second. Genuinely, like I'm at, how would you respond to someone if they were to ask you that? So think about that for a second. While we turn in our Bibles, if you have them, or on the app, we're gonna be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter seven. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, about 75% of the way through. Uh, and I think he has something, this is Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, really instructive for us in how we go about answering that question of what is a Jesus follower, who is that? <clears throat> so it's verses 15 through 23. And I apologize, I think you have a different version on the app if you are. You have the NIV and I have the TNIV. So it's similar, but I think you can follow along. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. All right. Kind of a tough passage, a lot we could say about that. What I wanna focus on is, I really think Jesus is emphasizing action. You know, know them by their fruit. Here's this thing that's kind of produced from you. It's outward, it shows on the outside. Those who do the will of my Father, away from me, evil doers. Do, 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 fruit. He's talking about action, how we live. There's a clear emphasis on that. <clears throat> and just to be super clear, like, I almost hesitate using this passage because I think it's just misinterpreted really easily. On a face reading, it could kind of seem like, oh my gosh, if I'm not morally perfect, Jesus is gonna reject me and sentence me to hell. Uh, that's not the gospel. I don't think that's what's going on here. Uh, if you wanna do a deep dive on this, I'd love to have a conversation. We can go out for coffee and that would be great. But just for this morning, what's crucial is Jesus is insisting on the importance of how we live how we live our life. And to put a finer point on it, the Apostle Paul, uh, who's writing a little bit after Jesus, writes to this people group in this place called Galatia. So we have a letter in our Bible called the Letter to the Galatians. And he says this about the fruit Jesus was talking about. Like, what in the world, Clint, is a fruit? What is that? Here's what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Here's the point. From the very beginning, Jesus' intention was that we would be a people known for our fruit, 
or how we live. Since the very beginning, that was the intention. That's what a Jesus follower is. Someone who has the fruit of the Spirit evident in their life. That was the marker. That was supposed to be the distinctive of what it meant to be someone who follows Jesus. And it was for a while. And then something happened. Boom, boom, boom. This big moment in church history where people started to shift away from that, from the marker of being how we live to something else. And that big something was this dude, Emperor Constantine. Have you seen these AI deals that can like look at a statue and kind of make the human face for it? I don't know if that's really what he looked like, but as good a guess as any. Pretty convincing, but you can kind of put a face to the name. Emperor Constantine is an emperor of Rome. And like, oh, he did some bad stuff, like a lot. But one good thing that he did was, if you recall from history perhaps, uh, the Christian people in the early church were heavily persecuted and even killed for their beliefs. It was illegal to be a Christian, let alone uh, tell other people about it. And so you could be sentenced to execution in the Colosseum, by trial by execution by a lion tearing you to pieces while onlookers are entertained. Horrible. So Constantine got rid of that. No more of that. It's now legal to be a Christian. And so kind of what happened was, I mean, being persecuted like that is a really galvanizing, unifying force among the Christians. Once that stopped, dissension began to creep in, disagreement, some debate, maybe some healthy debate, which is fine, but what was happening is this Roman Empire began to fracture apart because of that disagreement. And you have to remember, I should have put a graphic up here, the Roman Empire is huge at this time. It's a lot of Europe, it's the Middle East, the whole north of Africa, it's massive. It's hard enough to maintain control of the thing, and now you got these Christians kind of like starting to divide it up, and Constantine's like, we cannot have that. We will not disrupt the power structure, and maybe that's for the best. I'm not uh, judging him for doing that, but how he did it was, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna bring leaders from all over the Roman Empire, all expense paid, I'm gonna spare no expense, it's, it's expensive to travel from Spain to Italy in the Roman world, so I'm gonna pay your way, but we're all gonna come together and whoop, you're gonna come to this council chamber and darn it, we're gonna sit here until we agree. Enough of these disagreements, we're gonna come up with the official Christian doctrines. These are the official Christian beliefs and if you don't agree with them, you will be kicked out of the church, namely, and additionally, out of my empire, you will literally have to move away if you find yourself in disagreement with this creed that we came up with. And so Constantine, this Roman emperor, was presiding over our, one of our first church councils, and he told them this, uh, to achieve unanimity and concord, let all contentious disputation be discarded, and let us seek in the divinely inspired word the solution of the questions at issue. So see that unanimity, meaning everybody, concord, consensus, harmony. We're not gonna disagree anymore. Throw those out. We're gonna find the right once and for all solution, answers to what you're arguing about. And people really did get kicked out, like leaders that were invited and other leaders were kicked out of the church and out of the empire because they did not agree with that. All right, so you made it through the little history part. Whew, all right, that wasn't too bad, right? Do you notice a shift because of that event that kind of like starting to dawn on you like what might have happened? So you have this council, which in our history books now is known as the Council of Nicaea. And if you grew up in the Catholic Church, you may have heard of the resulting official Christian beliefs and that's the Nicene Creed. Very important, very influential. And this marks the start of a trend that I think we carry today that we've inherited. And that is this. We uh, have become primarily concerned with theological beliefs and less about whether people are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. We've become more concerned with what people think and what they believe and less about how they actually live their life. Now, please hear me. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the Nicene Creed. 
that's been enormously influential. I would guess every single Christian church in our town is a direct inheritor of those ideas, Heartland included. If you put Heartland belief statement and the Nicene Creed, there's a tremendous overlap. It provided a lot of clarity and good discussions and very important document in our history. That's great. Beliefs matter. Beliefs matter a lot. What, how you believe and what you think about the world will directly influence how you live and how you act. So I'm very thankful for that. I don't know, I hesitate to bring this up, but um, yeah, I think we will. There is no more clear example in our world today of how much beliefs matter than the Middle East, what's going on over there. The evil terrorist regime called Hamas and the devastation they wrought on the people of Israel um, is largely a result of their horrible false beliefs. If you believe that Jewish people are subhuman, filthy trash that need to be tossed out and discarded and driven into the sea, then yeah, that's gonna influence the horrendous things that were perpetrated there. Like beliefs matter a ton and I'm, believe me, I'm all in favor of the project of trying to get rid of bad false beliefs and try to replace them with good and true ones. That is a good project to do. I'm in favor of that. A lot of good in the world could come from doing that. All that being said, back to us as a church, I think we just totally lose the plot when we get so focused on making sure that everyone agrees and thinks exactly the same way about all these different topics in theology primarily. We lose sight of the original vision to be a people known by their fruit. Are we walking in the Holy Spirit? What should really be binding us together is that we exemplify the fruit. And here's our big idea for today, more of a call to action, really. Let us be a people known by our fruit and not just our facts or our beliefs. Let us be a people who are known by love and joy and peace and patience and the rest of them than just by our beliefs. Again, beliefs, very important. I think I've made that perfectly clear. But what if the first thing that you thought of or anyone would thought, thought of when they thought of Christians was the way that Christians lived, that they, that they exemplified that fruit? And I get it, like none of us are perfect. We're, we're, I don't think there's this expectation that we would just be totally flawless every single second, like we're gonna fall short of that. But what if like we just kind of retooled a little bit how we think about things toward uh, realigning with that original vision Jesus and Paul had. What kind of, what an amazing legacy we could leave if the reputation that we passed on to our kids was a church known for exemplifying the fruit of the Spirit. I think it'd be incredible. Jesus says, they will know you by your fruit. So I wanna kind of wind down here with a little exercise. Uh, behind me are two lists and they are not meant to like match or correspond, so don't try to find any connections. They're just two separate lists. And I think I've got this memorized right and left. On the left side are our fruit of the Spirit, which we kind of read about in Galatians. We've got that. And now take a look at this right column. Here are some beliefs. And kind of read through those. God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. The only way to be saved is through Jesus. Here are some things. I would say that all of those are incredibly important, if not essential, central doctrines of Christianity. They're, they're kind of what make Christianity a unique uh, worldview in the this, this landscape of world religions. Like that's their distinctive, that's how they're known. I believe them, I think most of us in this room believe those things, like we get it, okay. Here's my challenge. What if, we, uh, yeah, I would say that there's this tendency to hold more tightly to the idea that someone needs to believe all of that than they do to live in the way on the left column. Do we hold more tightly to the idea that someone has to agree with all of this than we do that they need to at least be intending to live in this way? 
And I get that like <laughs> the right test answer to this is like, Clint, it's, it's both and. Both beliefs and the way we live are super important. You, like you said, you live out of your beliefs, so we need to have both. I get it. <laughs> I get the both and. Very easy to say. Uh, and I'm just finding in myself, I don't know if this resonates with you, I don't always live out both and. Like I confess that I absolutely gravitate toward the belief end of things. I'm more likely to include or exclude people based on what they believe. Even in my pastoring, meeting with people, some of you, I apologize, and discipling, I tend to gravitate toward the belief side. That's just my wheelhouse. I find it more clean and straightforward. And we can present objective reasons and evidence and come what may. Like I just, I thrive in that space. The left side's messy. We have complex family and life situations that evade easy answers and it's just messy to sit with someone and like try to figure out what's going on with these through the spirit. And then perhaps worst of all, I for sure self-assess my own spirituality based on the accuracy of my beliefs than whether the fruit of the spirit is evident in my life. And I, I wish it were not that way. I'm actively, I felt very convicted by having to give this message and um, what the Holy Spirit was saying to me about that. So as we kind of wrap up, and Dave has a few words after we're done, <clears throat> um, but I just want us to table the belief part for a moment, look at this list, and kind of similar to last week, just take a moment and just try to notice, is the Holy Spirit highlighting one of these fruit to me? Maybe when I read it earlier, in the message or right now, I would guess that since the Holy Spirit's in the business of trying to do this and transform, one of those is leaping off the screen and the Holy Spirit is saying, man, I would love for you to submit this part of your life to me and let's work on that together. I know I've got mine's up there for sure and it's patience. I, I bring it up, praise every time I preach, I'm in this phase of life with my kids and I'm impatient sometimes and he's working on me, I'm trying my best but like that, I feel convicted by that when I see that and I want to be one known for the fruit of patience, I do. So let's pray together, but before I do that, I wanna read this part in James, uh, the book of James that I think really captures um, what this is all about. <clears throat> Faith or beliefs by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do or by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, <laughs> we don't, we don't wanna be like demons who believe all of this stuff on the right column and bear none of it on the left, no fruit. God, help us be a people that are known by our fruit. We can have the beliefs, and those are great, those are so important, but if we're not known for these fruit, we're, we're spinning our wheels. God, that you would convict us, and even as we go about our life, as we just, I think now we have the tools to recognize how we've been influenced in the past, what kind of presumptions, assumptions, customs do we carry forth in our world today that we've inherited from the past? And how can we make a, a sea change, a corrective to noticing, uh, even shift back toward having a priority on the fruit? How am I actually living? How am I interacting with other people? Am I judging them and casting them aside because of their beliefs? Or am I looking at what's going on in their life and the fruit? So God, help us be a people more concerned with how we're living and not just about our beliefs. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.